Ezekiel Kralin wrote The Hero's Journey. Email correspondence from October 28 to November 1. Subject, the Marshall Plan, October 28th. As, i uh, sorry, I was planning to keep my airwave pieces 20 minutes uh, or under, seeing as last Friday's narration came to 22 minutes, including the digital voice reading of the missing text, so I posted to Marshall McGee the following. The passages I send you are around 20 minutes each, some a tad shorter, others a tad longer. The Paris piece you read total 22 minutes after I inserted a digital voice reading of the missing text. So he replied, quote, Less than 15 minutes long is best for me, but you do what you need to do. Just for an experiment, try brutally, whimsically cutting one to five or ten minutes and see what it looks like. It might be better. Well, that's quite a challenge to cut five minutes out of my tale, Watson, for even at 20 minutes, tis nonetheless a mere passage from a chapter and not the entire chapter itself. After all, my stories are my babies, born of excruciating labor, were they real flesh and blood offspring, I'd have no problem chopping off a limb or two. But for Christ's sake, I'm an author, not a kitchen-dwelling, barefoot, pregnant wench. Or, as I like to say, when criticizing heterocentric dogma, it takes no brains to insert rod A into slot B. But it certainly does take brains to give birth through the creative process and much intense drawn-out pangs to produce a final result of genius. So much so, in fact, I'm tempted to hand out cigars each time I beget another mini-masterpiece offspring from the loins of my cerebral travails. Nonetheless, I accept Marshall's preference to reduce the length of my tales to less than 15 minutes for the sake of having them read over the air, seeing as it's an honor and a great opportunity. Though good grief, chopping them down to 10 or even a scant 5 minutes, blasphemy blasphemy. On his last podcast, McGee exclaimed how he likes people who write books, which may be one reason why he's eager to read my stories once again, in addition to, well, my superbly eccentric writing style and prolific outpouring. Blush. In fact, so superb and eccentric that George Dennis recently posted this hilarious critique of my Paris tale to the announcement list. Quote, what a fucking idiot. I actually try to listen to this. It makes no sense. You are the worst writer in the world. Go find a manhole cover. What can I say, Watson? But Mr. Dennis has instantly become my favorite critic. Deke update. I'm finding newfound strength dealing with his atrocities, though it's been a rough ride emotionally these past several days. He has not dropped by since our heated clash, even though his latest payday has come and gone, which I believe is a good thing. For it is obvious to me a new phase has begun, where I must let go of the pups and place absolute trust in kismet. They shall be perfectly fine through it all. In fact, my bodhisattva premise demands I do so. If I've learned anything from its teachings and the many previous real-life challenges, which have all resolved themselves admirably well when I cease to worry and do my best to maintain a positive light. For once again... This latest crisis has caused the demons of negative fantasy to rise to my consciousness, and it is my responsibility and mine alone to vanquish each one ASAP, worry over the pup's happiness and well-being, Deke's threatening behavior, imagining worst-case scenarios, all demons I've managed to quell by focusing on relaxation and looking on the bright side. In short... All capital letters for this whole paragraph. Never cave in to dark forces, whether from within oneself or without. Allay them all with kind and beautiful thoughts and actions. Do not fight them like enemies as drama queens and fake heroes do. But realize they are also teachers. Therefore, learn from these challenges. They fling at your feet and be grateful. If I'm correct that Deke is but my main bodhisattva guardian these days, he knows this. Thus, acted out a painful scenario and departed, allowing me time to figure things out, grow into a higher realm of existence as a result. And the San Francisco Police Department, of all people, facilitated my transition into this new phase, making them my guardians, likewise. They even drove all the houseless out of the Castro for good measure that I tend to my own needs right now. I know this is not all about me, but the timing is clearly to my benefit. And yes, I will resume his allowance once he gives proof he is treating the dogs with love at all times. Until then, though, no dice. 
Re Hero's Journey, October 29th. Deke has yet to show up again, though I thought I heard the doggies bark a block up at Casterwin Market an hour ago. Broke my heart. My stomach twists when I think of how he mistreats the dog. There's a lot of justified anger there. I cannot possibly hand him any more money as a result, nor do him any other favors, such as change, sorry, charge his electronics, bring him tea, a disposable razor, and so on. I will, however, continue to give him dog food. But walking around with a shopping cart or wagon or something of that kind has become verboten here in the Castro. People are sick of the homeless imposing their lives on everyone else. It's gotten way out of hand. But this is what happens in a collapsing economy without any real safety net. Though their lifestyle is not something I want either. Booze halls, shallow friendships, crass behavior, snobbery, backstabbing, childish mindsets, vapid goals, tacky music. Nobody gives a fuck about anyone else. It's all about money. I am on the hero's journey. And a sense of utter gloom and failure is part of the cycle, part of the challenge as well. I saw it coming for a long time, as I've been through it many times before, as I've had many such journeys, starting with Randolph Taylor. Don't look forward to it, but just riding it through is the best way to cope. Putting Deke through such a demanding trial by exiting him out of my life when he is so mentally discombobulated seems cruel, but he forced my hand. He won't allow me to associate with him anymore, and thus I lose the dogs along with him. It's sink or swim time for the Cajun trickster. It'll be all right in the long run. He'll come through this a much better person, and the dogs will thrive. Images of worst-case scenarios threaten to tear me down, but I know they are illusions and not to pay them any mind. Subject. Halloween Below My Window, November 1st. See snapshot. A grim scene. Deontay remains crashing out every night by the ATM spot. His sleeping bag is looking raggedy these days, and that chair, that damn chair, he still has it. The fucking thing is taunting me, still in like-new condition, fellow on the right is sitting on it. I've seen other homeless people with it down the block, up the block, across the street. Maybe Deontay rents it out, a dollar an hour for a comfy sit. Considering the dearth of benches in the Castro because of anti-unhoused sentiment, that is, sorry, that is credible. The wobbly wooden benches as the defunct Café Floré with the last to go, at the defunct Café Floré with the last to go. My stubbed toe is hardly an issue, but just enough to make for awkward perambulation, so I figured, fuck it, I'll just stay in the hood and go to Pete's Coffee a half block up. Boring atmosphere of privileged queers, as usual, but I got some work done, replying to comments on the MCN discussion list and listening to more of Marshall's latest podcast through earbuds. Two hours later... I ambled up the street to Marcello's Pizza on Castro and Market to order a cheese slice plus a Diet Coke, but a few minutes before that, I paused near the Harvey Milk Toast Library because I heard Flacco's distinctive yip-woo, yip-woo. Her sweet doggy barks emanated from around the corner of a side street that skirted the library's eastern half while I stood on the west. I wanted so badly to run up to the hounds and shower them with kindness, but I was afraid their master would react with hostile rants and expletives in front of other houseless folks gathered nearby, or might even demand I watch them a while as he takes off like greased lightning. So with my heart broken for the umpteenth time, I continued my stroll toward Marcello's. Upon leaving Marcello's, I had only a half hour to go before I could return Hovel. Who should I see coming my way but Boulevard Joel... Joe, Boulevard Joe, great timing, as I wanted to speak to him further about Deke. He said he's going that way, toward Castro Street, which was just a half block behind me, gestured for me to walk with him, so I told him how Deke's own paranoia and macho facade have ruined my friendship with him. He keeps screaming at me for stupid reasons, threatens to get me beat up, tries to get others to gang up on me, and badmouths me to anyone who listen. He's abusing those dogs, feeding them chicken bones, tying them to a standing bike that can easily crash down on them, shoves them away with anger, forces them to shiver all night long, and yells at them. This behavior could get worse, and not just the police, but people walking by see that could wind up calling animal control. I took a deep breath as we moseyed along and continued. But I have an idea that might be key towards resolving his self-destructive behavior. Here's what I have in mind. 
Joe abruptly cut me off and scurried over to a small group of vagrants hanging out by the transit stop right across the street from Marcello's, leaving me behind in the dust. It's almost always like this, Watson. Whenever I have something important to say, Joe hardly has a moment to spare. Thus, I often have to wait until I see him again, which might be days or weeks later, or even months. Infuriating. But I waited patiently from fifteen feet away, hoping to complete my appeal, and within several minutes he signaled me to resume our walk, which took us down Castro Street toward 18th. Just a few more words, Joe, I resumed. I've spoken to several of his friends about his mistreating the dogs, encouraging them to call him on it whenever they witness abuse, but I don't think anyone's followed through. Needless to say, this includes Boulevard Joe, though I left that part out, and I finally came to the crux. The few times I've seen him on shrooms, he's been a much more benign he's been much more benign and cooperative. My idea is to encourage him to take shrooms more often, as it seems to be good medicine for him. Every time he takes it, his regard for the dogs is kind and it facilitates friendly communication between us. To my surprise and disappointment, his response was less than hopeful. But then you'll have to deal with other bad effects of frequent shroom use. That aspect, if true, never occurred to me, good physician, but I thought perhaps he made that statement to discourage cutting into his meth peddling. But couldn't he also barter with shrooms, though maybe not as expedient and profitable as crystal, because less demand? I just don't know. So I replied, well, maybe encourage him to take shrooms a bit more often, instead of just once every three or four months, perhaps like once a month. That would be, wouldn't be overdoing it, right? He lit up, smiled, and said, yeah, that could work. Upon those uplifting words, though maybe spoken just to dismiss me, I shook his hand and thanked him for listening and finally returned to my monk's cell at Hotel California North. Relieved to have communicated to one of Deke's associates a possibly life-saving suggestion on behalf of both the doggies and my troublesome trickster, This morning was a morbid gray, and a light rain had just begun, which grew heavier on my return, though not by much. You could still get by without an umbrella. The rain ceased a few hours ago, but the air remains chill, and two little doggies are out there with a sad excuse of a master, and there's nothing I can do about it other than make continued appeals to people on the streets. The pups most likely get sick and... The pups'll most likely get sick and die and I'd have a Cajun maniac on my hands attempting to get me beat up and evicted unless I sick the cops on him. What a horrid way to end my brindlekin tales. May the fates conjure up a miracle, and may I vanquish the demons of worst-case scenarios from haunting my thoughts. What, me worry? It's just another day in paradise. 